Good afternoon. Thank you so much for being with us uh, this evening. As you can see, we're in a completely different setting tonight. Uh, we are back in the sanctuary, praise the Lord. And uh, we got a great group here with us tonight. And we also got a great group with us uh, uh, virtually. And uh, so th there I am, right there in the sanctuary. So uh, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Uh, pray that you've had, and this is for everybody, obviously, pray that each and every one of you have had a, a, a blessed day. And um, if you have a copy of God's Word, I would love to invite you uh, to turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 13. And uh, we are continuing tonight uh, looking at uh, uh, a parable of Jesus Christ. Uh, and I'm actually, Lord willing, I'm going to try to do two tonight. And I've, I've been thinking about this for, for about, a, about a week now, obviously, and then really drilling down uh, and praying about it for tonight and being with each and every one of you. Um, this, this is, um, I may not do a very good job at it, I'm going to tell you that right now, but I'm going to tell you that tonight's going to be a true uh, Bible study. So uh, obviously, uh, I'm, I'm so looking forward to being back in a, meeting back together, and, and before I forget, uh, to our virtual congregation, uh, also this coming Sunday night, we will be meeting again uh, on site, so on site and online uh, once again, so I wanted to share that with you before I forget, so as always, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, once again, we've been uh, thinking, we've been um, talking about as we gather here in the sanctuary tonight, just how beautiful a, a day it has been. And God, it is because that you have, you have been the artist of it. You have been the creator of it. And Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for this time that we can come together in this free nation, Lord. Open the word of God. Be with each other. And just learn from you. Learn more about you so we can be drawn closer to you, Lord. And Lord, that's exactly my prayer for tonight. So God, each and every one that's with us uh, on site and online, uh, Father, we lift up all the cares and concerns that are on their mind tonight, those names, those families, those situations, those strangers, those conversations that we have been in since the last time we were together, Father. May we be sensitive to each other, to the needs of each other. May we love more and grow more, Lord, during this time. God, we love you. Thank you for loving us. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, Amen. In Luke chapter 13, I want us to look tonight at verses 18. Uh, I, I'm going to say this, if, if you'll let me. Uh, we're going to look at verse 18 and 19 tonight, looking at the parable about the mustard seed. This is not the passage of Scripture where Jesus is talking to the disciples about you are to have the faith of a mustard seed. This is a parable where Jesus is, he is in the, uh, he is in the, the synagogue. He is with the disciples. Uh, he is with people that don't like him. Uh, he is with people that hate him. He is with people that want him out of there. And the reason for that is because he is the son of God. He is proclaiming to be the Messiah. In Luke chapter 13, if we were to read it in its entirety, we would find that uh, Jesus is there. There's been a woman that has been led in the synagogue, and this is her disease. She is bent completely over just like this. And Jesus has conversation with her. Jesus heals her, gets her straight, uh, straight back up, if you'll let me put it that way, gets her back up, and the murmuring and the talking and all of that starts. When you look at Luke chapter 13, verses 18 and 19, it is a parable like none other. You'll not find another parable in the Word of God like this one. And the reason, uh, the reason that we can say that tonight and know that tonight is this is the only parable. Now, now listen to me carefully. This is the only parable in the Word of God that stresses the insignificant beginning of the kingdom of God. It is the insignificant beginning of the kingdom of God. And that's what we're going to look at. That's what we're going to unpack here in just a few moments. 
So if we're looking at, if you look at verse 18, and I don't want to read it formally just yet uh, as, as I do. Look at verse 18. Look at the very first thing that Jesus says. Look at the question that he asks. And he's talking to the people that are there in front of him. And he says, what is the kingdom of God like? So th obviously Jesus speaking, his words, it should draw us to the attention of what is he asking here? He is setting up to what the kingdom of God is exactly like. So the question is that we need to ask ourselves tonight is what is the kingdom of God? I want to walk you to the best of my ability through maybe what I would call the cliff note version starting in Genesis and coming up to this portion of scripture this this time and let's look at the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? Well, in short, it is the work of God. Amen. The kingdom of God is the work of God. It has nothing to do um, with anything that man has done. The kingdom of God is all about what God has done. In the Old Testament, as, you, as we fly 30,000 feet over the Old Testament, we find that God rules sovereignly over his work, over the creation, as the creator his rule as the king if you'll let me use that as the king as the creator his rule is to be acknowledged in the form of a contract in the form of a bond or that of a covenant and you honored that covenant or that covenant was honored based upon a relationship with god through that of love through that of loyalty through that of trusting Him, and through that of spirit, of honoring God and obeying God. If you were to take the Old Testament and look at the theme of it, it is basically the kingdom through the covenant of God that He has established with His people. Now, where does that covenant show up? That covenant shows up in Genesis chapter 1. Because you can't have a covenant with man if there is no man to have a covenant with. And my point is, we have the covenant established on the very first page of the Holy Scripture when God created man in his own image. I want you to think about something. And I know, I know this has been in the news recently when we think of statues that represent history and things of that nature, I'm not bringing it up based because of that. But I want you to think about something. Think about places where there have been kings and queens that live or somebody famous uh, that, has, that, has, uh, that has grown up in that town. They, 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 they've been established. They're, they're, they're not, they're not, I'm not talking about famous people. I'm talking about those, I forgot I can't walk. Uh, Y'all help me out now. I haven't done this in a year and a half, right? Uh, sorry. Um, but somebody uh, ha has ruled and reigned um, maybe a president. I've, I've never seen a statue of a president. I'm sure they exist, but uh, I'm, I know there's statues of, of, of emperors and, and Nero and, and all that in certain places. And that established, that shows that that individual ruled and reigned. I want you to look at Adam as the statue that God has formed standing in the garden. Because that statue shows us that God has formed not only the garden, but he's also formed man. And there man stands in the garden to begin this covenant with God. When you go to Genesis chapter 12, you start seeing and reading and learning, obviously, about the uh, Abrahamic covenant of the people of Abram and, uh, and God. Hebrews eleven eighteen. 8, 10, if you're taking notes, and this is, this is a little bit of an introduction about this verse. I, I'm sorry, but I, I feel like it's important to talk about this a little bit. I, I want you to write down, if you're taking notes, I'm going to share, uh, uh, Brian, if you'll help me out, um, Hebrews eleven eight through ten. Uh, Hebrews eleven eight through ten. Uh, you don't. I don't. You can if you want. If you're fast, you turn there. But I want you to listen to these words for just a moment that the Bible gives us in Hebrews chapter eleven. The Bible says in Hebrews eleven eight, by faith 
Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive an inheritance. And when he went out, not knowing where he was going, now listen to this, by faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. That, that covenant. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. God has established his covenant with Abram. Technically, Abraham. When you go to book of Judges in 17.6, you will find the words that the people did what was right in their own eyes, but we still have God ruling over his people as the king. There's still that covenant. And we fast forward to 2 Samuel, and we have the Davidic covenant of God with God and David. After all, the Bible says that David was an individual after God's own heart. The Davidic covenant was God's king, was God being the king, seeking to bring the people of God and the nations under God's rule. This is what God wanted David to do, to bring the people back to God. David was basically the mediator between God and the people. But the people failed to abide. They, they didn't listen. And we have coming and marching on the scenes. We have literally the prophets and what I call the wise men from back then. When you read, uh, Pastor Zach walked you through minor prophets uh, Wednesday, Sunday night, and Wednesday, I believe it was. But either way, he walked us through the minor prophets some. And I will tell you, in all of the minor prophets, and, and really in all the prophets, the major and the minor, their message is somewhat exactly the same. And you can link it to three things. The prophets are saying to the people of God that have obeyed God, disobeyed God, living in sin, having their idols, not turning from them. So the prophets come on the scene and they start announcing, you need to repent. There's three things. Know this about the prophets and you'll have it. They said, repent, right? They said, if you repent, you'll receive God's mercy, right? If you don't repent, you will receive God's judgment. That's the prophets in a nutshell. The message, getting the people back to God. That was, that was, their, that was their calling on their life. The prophets were bringing the people back to basically what is called the Sinai Covenant, the Law of Moses. And, 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 and then we get to Jeremiah. Brian, please, Jeremiah 31, 31. Write that down, please, Jeremiah 31, 31. Now, this is a little lengthy, but I want you to hear it because then Luke 13, 18 is going to kind of pop off the page at you. In 30, Jeremiah 31, 31, there's a new covenant starting to be announced. Isaiah's talked about it as we read Scripture. And Jeremiah says these words. If you don't have a Bible, please look at the screen because I want you to get this. He said, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I've made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they, after those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts and I will be their God. And they shall be my people. No more shall every man. Now get this now. No more shall every man teach his neighbor. And every man his brother saying know the Lord. For they all shall know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them. Says the Lord. 
for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Who is Jeremiah talking about? Talk to me. The Messiah. He's coming. So we have the kingdom of God. We just very quickly, and maybe even poorly, you could say, but very quickly we have come to the Old Testament and arrived at the New Testament. And when you get to the New Testament, you see the fullest revelation of God's divine rule in the person of Jesus Christ standing there. Y'all have been virtual too long. <laughs> Verse 18, Luke 13, 18. Let's read 18 and 19, pretty please. And the Bible says, then he said, what is the kingdom of God like? And what shall I compare it? It's like a mustard seed. Now right there, how many of you really could say, really? It's like a mustard seed. Now watch this. This is good stuff here. Which a man took, which is God, and put in his garden. And it grew and became a large tree. And the birds of the air nested in its branches. Brian, if I could have the first picture, please, sir, of the seed. Now, I was going to I, I was going to um, go to the grocery store today and buy a thing of mustard seed. If you ever, don't ever try to get in my mind, because it'll stress you out. And I thought, well, how are you going to give it to them? And I said I could buy a Ziploc bag. There'd be a lot of Ziploc bags and. I don't know if you have mustard seed in your house or not. You can buy it in the seasons. Whole. But I thought that was a pretty pretty good picture to give you an idea of. It is up there, right? So you're telling me, Jesus, that the kingdom of God is is this? Is like is this? Why did he use the mustard seed? I will tell you that it wasn't. Now, this is where you got to kind of be careful. It wasn't the smallest seed of biblical times. It wasn't. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It wasn't the it wasn't the smallest seed of biblical times, but it was the smallest seed that the, a lot of the people in biblical times was familiar with. So that's the reason Jesus used it. He brings that. He brings that earthly truth. Beside the, beside the heavenly meaning. And as I told you in the very beginning of parables, when you see the word like, get ready for a parable. The reason he used the mustard seed for what it becomes. Brian, the next picture, please, sir. There's a mustard tree seed. A mustard seed tree. Now this tree can grow up to 20 feet. It's a unique tree because as you see, and that's not a very great picture of one, but the, you see how the limbs, a lot of times limbs grow up because they go to the sun, right? But a lot of trees, and you can see this one's been probably pruned maybe. There's several pictures of, tree, of mustard trees, I call them on the internet. Um, I don't know that we saw any over there that we were made aware of, do you? But... What's unique about this tree is the limbs, they'll hang low. They grow kind of down, but the leaves on them are oval. So the oval gives the shade. And people would go to the mustard tree to rest, those that were traveling, and they would sit under the shade as a place of refuge. Don't forget that. As a place of refuge. Any of you watching the series on Pure Flick Chosen with the disciples? Besides, you watching it? 
if you have Pure Flix, if you don't have it, I encourage you to get it just to watch Chosen. Stay out of this. Um, okay, you don't have to have it. And, and maybe, maybe you watching. But I believe it was the second or third. It's, it's the life of Jesus and how and that I'm watching so far is how he picks the disciples and who he picks. And it's just a, it's, there's a lot of great biblical Bible movies out there. But this one is all, I mean, it is so, of course, you have to do a lot of filling in with the Bible, but it's very accurate. Now, the reason I share that with you is when Jesus was with the children in one of the episodes, he was, have any of you ever thought about how they brushed their teeth back then? In the, sh in, the, in, the, in the series, Jesus was brushing his teeth with a twig. And when I, when I saw it, I'm like, so that's how they brushed their teeth. The twigs of the mustard tree was used to brush your teeth because that twig has properties. That twig has properties in it that combat bacteria and plaque. So just just a fun fact, just a just a fun fact there. But this is not the first time seeds were mentioned in the Bible, is it? Jesus used seeds. There was the parable of the sower and the seeds. We've talked about that, that and the soil. It's not the first time a tree was used about a kingdom. Now, here's where I want you to turn. Will you go to Daniel chapter 4? Go to Daniel chapter 4, please. Daniel chapter 4 and verse 10. This is Nebuchadnezzar. He's having a dream. He's, he's called for Daniel to interpret the dream. And in Daniel chapter 4, verse 10, I still hear pages turning, so I'll give you just a second. Daniel chapter 4, verse 10, listen to what is said about Nebuchadnezzar's dream. In verse 10, the Bible says, These were the visions of my head while on my bed. I was looking, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. It's no different than the mustard tree seed. The mustard seed tree, right? The tree grew and became strong. Its height reached to the heavens, and it could be seen to the ends of all the earth. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it. The birds of the heaven dwelled in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. But what ends up happening to that tree? That tree ends up being cut down. That kingdom ends up, that kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar ends up falling. That tree falling. He begins to, to have that of insanity. He loses all of his rule and reign. In Daniel chapter 5, it's given to the Persians. But this tree that Jesus is talking about, this tree that represents the kingdom of God, it's not going to fall. Amen? It's not going to fall. It is that tree that we can go to and find that shade, that find that refuge to get that strength that we need to just to be able to make it. There was always concerns when you pay attention to disciples and conversations, whether it's the Olivet Discourse, or whether, whether it's the, the very last thing in Acts chapter 1, verse 6, the very last thing just prior to Jesus ascending. He was asked a question about the kingdom. The kingdom was of major importance to, to the Jewish people. They always wanted, they thought, as you well know, they thought this strong military leader was going to come and save them and rescue them from the oppression of Rome. And that's all they cared about. That's all they were concerned about. And matter of fact, Acts 1, 6, the very last thing that said to Jesus in Scripture, they said, therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore 
the kingdom to Israel. It's a big deal. This kingdom, and it should be a big deal to us. I want you to note in the text there when Jesus says, what is the kingdom of God like and to what shall I compare it? He said, it's like a mustard seed, which a man, which is God, placed it in the garden. Now for, for some great Bible study, when you look at the word, the man took, when God took the seed and he placed it in the garden, that Greek word there is Laban, and it translated deliberately. We all, everybody in this room, and I pray everybody virtually right now, always knew that Jesus was present at the creation and he has always been the redemptive plan for man to be saved from their sins, saved from our sins. It was deliberately done by God Almighty. It was not by chance. It didn't just happen. It was on purpose that that seed was planted there. I have other scripture for you. I don't want to take time to read it, but... I'll just tell you one of them, Psalm 102, 25, Psalm 102, 25, this David said of old, you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the works of your hands. God, you've done this. Then we see the, the not only the garden, but we see that it grew and became a large tree. When you study Luke, you're going to find out. And when when you when you when you when you drill down on Luke, he's kind of got just he remember he's writing to the Gentiles. That's who he's referencing here. Jesus is referencing here too is the birds. It's the Gentiles. They're welcome into the kingdom. Luke's main purpose is to show that the kingdom was to move from one individual, Jesus Christ, and cause a great movement. Think about this just for a second and I know exactly what I'm saying and don't get mad at me. Let me finish. I want to tell you that the gospel began with one man. Now I know God was with him. But it began with one man. And his name is Jesus. It began with Jesus. And he came from a town that nothing good can come out of Nazareth. In a country that everybody hated. Nobody liked Israel. But Jesus came. He bore that. He picked it up and he took it. He took it and he moved it. He moved out alone with it. And then he moved to 12 men. Yes, one betrayed him. But he moved to 12 men. For the kingdom of God. They weren't prestigious. They didn't really have positions. They were fishermen and hated tax collectors, as you well know. And can we agree on something? Those 12 disciples, when they were beginning, and as we have the luxury of the scripture, when we see their life, when we see them walking, they experienced little faith at times. Well, what did it grow to? Well, before we get the present day, I want to tell you that it grew to a church. And that first church, based upon keeping kind of this in context, okay? That 12 grew, or technically that 11, grew to 120 in the upper room at Pentecost. The Bible says that when Peter stood up, by names and number, there was 120. And from that room, from that room, we're sitting here tonight. Because the kingdom of God has just kept right on growing. Are we going to keep it growing? You've heard this, you've heard this, you've heard this. I've, I've, the longer I serve as your pastor, the more meetings I'm in within the county, 
within the state and with the nation. And the Southern Baptist Convention, I'm all for. Don't mix my words. I'm all for the North American Mission Board, the International Mission Board. We are to really celebrate church plants. I, I pray one day, that's one thing that's on my prayer list, that one day we can plant a church somewhere. I ask you to join me in praying that. It's in my journal on a certain day of the week that one day we'll plant a church somewhere to advance the kingdom of God. But y'all, 19 churches are closing every week in the United States. And guess what? The plants are not offsetting those that are closing. One statistic that you've heard me say over and over again and I know I need to hush. But one statistic that I keep saying, you'll hear, you've heard me say it, you'll hear me say it again. That we're one generation away of the church being what the church is today. Do you know what the, do you know what the purpose, and, 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 and I know it's kind of like, well, I'm, I'm just going to, if you don't mind, I'm just going to tell you what the purpose of church is. The purpose of the church is to make disciples for Jesus Christ. I will tell you, in my opinion, that the purpose of Sunday school is to make disciples of Jesus Christ. Now, the other things, that's what we do. I'm not saying we don't do those, but the purpose is to make disciples so the kingdom can grow. I'm in an evangelism course right now with Fruitland. And one of my professors said the other day, and I don't have time to go into it, he said it's better to train people to make disciples than it is to lead someone to Christ. That took me a while. That's the purpose. Sunday night, I had a video project done. Excuse me, I had a video project that was due. And Brian helped me make that Sunday night. And in short, I was sharing, Brian was a, um, we were role playing, but I had to be, I had to be me. And par part of it was sharing the gospel. And we had the video and I had to send it to one of my, one of my professors. And part of, part of, part of my testimony is a, by the, a lady by the name of Miss Helen Phillips at Village Point Methodist Church. And you know, I, I don't want to take, I could, I would love to, but I don't want to take the time to sh tell, the, tell you everything. But I know y'all have had a long day. I'm just excited to be back in the sanctuary. But Miss Helen Phillips was the first person that I can cognitively remember sharing the gospel with me. And I told that in my video the other night. And you know, I got to thinking about it. If she hadn't, would I be your pastor today? I often challenge you to think about those that shared the gospel with you. Who told you about Jesus? Who helped who helped you come in faith, come to faith in Jesus Christ? You know what they did? They put you right under that mustard tree of the kingdom of God. Amen. That's what they did. And it started small. And it grew. And even with people that don't like you, and the longer I live, the more I learn that people don't like me. 
because Jesus was standing in front of people that didn't want him there. And he was confident. He was confident that God was planting that kingdom on earth through him. And Jesus had a desire for that kingdom to grow and for that kingdom to succeed. Do we share that same desire tonight as Christians inside these walls at Soldier Bay, online at Soldier Bay's Facebook page, do we share that same desire that Jesus shared? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again, Lord, for your word, for your precious word, for your holy word. Lord, that word that brings life, that word that brings eternal life, God, we thank you once again for this opportunity. God, will you help us? God, will you help us? Lord, if you allow me, if we have been uh, sinful in not thinking about the kingdom growing, like Jesus has spoke to us tonight in Scripture, Father, we want to tell you right now that we're sorry. And we want to repent and we want to turn. And so, Father God, will you help us now to be conscious of our conversations, of our relationships, to advance the kingdom of God and to plant that seed for it to grow and provide that place of refuge, that shade that we're sitting under right now, God, I want to thank you tonight for Miss Helen Phillips. God, I want to thank you tonight for you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, Amen. God is good. And all the time. Amen. God bless you.